Pondilit Fest is happy to announce that we have bookstalls at the venue featuring titles by all authors and speaking at PLF 2024. Books by Sri Aurobindo Ashram are specially featured. The feast festival also features an independent stall by Anadi Foundation for the great work they are doing in education, well-being, sustainability, culture and heritage and an independent stall by GoForce promoting nationalism through merchandising and gifting. The Ponde Lit Fest would like to thank our platinum partner, Motwani Jadeja Foundation, our platinum digital partner, Asianet News Network, our gold partners, Mahindra Next Wealth and Embassy, our session and beverage partner, Radico, our session partner, Zoho and Janki Bath, and our travel partner, VTrip. Stay connected with the latest updates and highlights on PLF. Follow us on Twitter at Pondilitfest, on Insta and FB at PLF underscore Pondilitfest. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel at Pondilitfest for insightful videos and co event coverage. And share pictures using the hashtag, yeah, hashtag PLF2024. In our third and final session of the day, Pradeep Bhandari, National Spokesperson BJP, will make a presentation on Demography is Destiny. I'm starting. Uh, first light will go. So, uh, good evening, everyone, at the Pondi Lit Festival. Uh, you have Anand and uh, there and Shamika ji who gave a brilliant talk. And my title was earlier. Democ in fact, it is the right title. Now, earlier I thought of a title which is The Destiny is Demography. But then when I was moving from Chennai to Pondicherry and I was looking at a lot of primary data and after listening to the Honorable Governor's speech and also listening to Anand here, what I conclude and what I will try to prove you through primary data insights that our democracy's destiny is demography. So all the ideals of the Indian constitution that we speak about, the economic development that we speak about, all of this only and only hinges on one factor. And this what I conclude over the last eight years of traveling across the length and the breadth of the country, seeing absolutely skewed voting patterns, and I want to make you aware of an evolving danger which you do not see now but would definitely see in the next two decades to come. And this is why I conclude that if India continues to be a democracy, a thriving democracy, and if we intend to be a developed country and continue to grow at 8 to 10 percentage, what will definitely matter is how does the demography in this country shape? So this is why I say that our democracy's destiny is demography. Let me just throw an insight and uh, if this slide can move. Yeah. Uh, one sec. So what I want to uh, show you is where are we right now in India? Uh, someone can put the first slide please. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look where are we right now in India, the Hindu population growth rate, and I will towards the end tell you why am I mentioning a lot about population growth rate, because there is huge skewed patterns in terms of economic development in these two areas where the demography is tilted. Number two, also there is a veto power on the voting right which I have seen and this is what data tells you. And there is absolutely differentiated economic outlook of these two areas. So right now in this country, if you see that the Hindu population growth rate is roughly around 16 and a half to 17 percentage. 
and the non hindu population growth rate is roughly 24 to 25 percentage now why do i mention this i mention this because at this moment in this country there are many more districts where the population of the non hindu minority in particular the muslim minority is growing at a faster rate than the hindu majority now what does that do to your population what does that do to your outcome i will prove this in the slides to uh, uh, later on that places where the demography is 30 percentage tilted what do i refer by 30 percentage tilted which means that areas where the muslim minority population is 30 percentage data suggests after studying successive five elections whether at the state level or the voting outcome at the national level that there is a virtual veto which means that the fate of the 100 percentage electorate which votes is decided by the 30 percentage electorate which consolidates and this is why i am not talking about a demography skewing in a manner where it has skewed in areas of bengal which i will come to where it has skewed to a level where hindu minorities have become areas of border areas of bengal but i am talking about more than 100 lok sabha constituencies in this country possibly becoming a scenario in the next two decades where the muslim minority population can touch a 30 percentage now why is that a point which we should talk about and this is where i come to my second part if you look at certain two districts in this country and this is a case study which i will bring to you these are two districts one is in assam this is a lok sabha constituency also and one is in bengal now in 1950s you would have seen that the hindu population in those these two districts was more than the muslim population however now what do you see that in dubri the hindu population is the minority population where it is around 20 25 percentage and in murshidabad it is around 30 35 percentage now i don't have an issue with an a demography changing till the time it does not impact my outcomes now how does it impact my outcome in the last 50 years in these two lok sabha constituencies only a muslim candidate has won so if i talk about the tenet of secularism which is about protecting the minorities also in these two districts the earlier minorities have become the majorities and the hindu majority has become the minority and the hindu minority not even once in the last 50 years has been able to become a member of parliament or an mla so it's a virtual veto and the voting has only happened not on many economic criteria not only development criteria it has only and only happened on religious criteria and this is some this is a trend which has evolved in the last 5 decades in particular in the last two decades so if you imagine as a hindu or as a non minority as a non now you are a minority in these two districts work for the constituents in those areas if you as a government ensure that you provide the required benefits even if you ensure that development is thriving in those areas those do not become the criteria for the voter to decide who wins and loses what is the only primary criteria is religion and this is where i say that the tenet of indian constitution secularism is not followed in practice by those who vote in the electoral level because at the end of the day the way voting happens you will have your economic policies being driven these are not two isolated incidents these are two incidents which tell you what can be the potential threat i would not say a threat as the word but can be a potential challenge to come in two decades to come and another point i will tell you in these two districts the rate of muslim population growth is two and a half times the rate of hindu population growth so what you see as a trend is places where the hindus become minority 
they tend to leave those areas so what is exactly happening what is happening is and this is a trend which i am telling you and with these two and i will uh, tell you from other states also that the non hindu population once reaches a 25 30 percentage trend it becomes electoral veto in those areas after it reaches 40 45 percentage trend it is what decides everything so the hindus who become say 40 percent 30 percentage start getting socially and economically excluded from those areas and they tend to move away from those districts and lok sabha constituencies so what happens is that when the non hindu population touches a threshold of 30 percentage there is very limited probability a probability of less than 10 percentage that that 30 percentage will not become 50 percentage so which means what what it means is that places which are 30 35 percentage now in two decades to come will become 50 percentage plus and possibly in next 3 to 4 decades might become only muslim dominated districts this is what is happening as a trend and this is a very very alarming trend because those are the areas where the polity is practiced in a very different manner and only on religiosity let me move to my next statement yes now look at this trend and this is very very important this is nothing to do with geography i i spoke about two districts in the eastern part now let me tell you another district which is in the southern part and look at the interesting part i will tell you about kerala later malappuram for instance and this is very very important is comes right there in the southern part kerala is considered to be a highly literate state but does a highly literate non hindu population vote based on development economic parameter in the place or a district where the literacy is high but demography is close skewed so this malappuram is a very interesting case it is different from murshidabad it is different from for instance uh, uh, parts of bihar here the literacy is high but along with literacy being high the demography is skewed and this is a very very important point here also you see that since 1952 only a muslim candidate has won what does it establish as a trend it establishes as a very important challenge that even though your literacy levels are very very high it will have no bearing direct or indirect impact on your voting outcome so again we tend to think that higher the literacy more will be the developmental parameters in your polity that is not true based on primary data and places where your demography is skewed so imagine malappuram despite being 90 uh, despite being literacy level all time high in fact more than national average in many places still only votes based on religiosity now i come to the interesting part now i will tell i will take certain districts and this is kishan ganj in bihar now if you look at sir four districts i will tell you in particular which is kishan ganj murshidabad uh, to an extent this comes in parts of simanchal nadia malda west dinajpur these are all areas which surround bengal in bihar now in these areas all of them have a unique trend all of them in the last 2 to 2 and a half decades have become hindu minority areas all of them are adjacent to each other with hundreds of kilometers of distance this roughly combines a population of 2.8 crore muslim population this is a majority muslim population of 2.8 crores now the question which has to be asked that as this population has increased in these areas you have evidences and facts of illegal immigration increasing you have evidences and facts of homemade bomb making factories being found by a lot of security agencies and you have evidences and facts which prove that despite any government welfare these areas have become isolated silos lot of analysts think and 
foresee a danger that many of these districts are in the border areas and many border areas are seeing a phenomena where the primary district or the village might be a Hindu majority village but it is surrounded by Hindu minority areas and in that scenario what is very very important that imagine a scenario of a circle with a nucleus being Hindu majority it is surrounded by Hindu minority areas the issue is that the singular Hindu majority areas in this these districts I'm talking about tends to become a Hindu minority areas so all these districts earlier what was the phenomena which was followed in your border districts everything was not a skewed demography your Hindu majority area was in the center it was surrounded by areas villages which were Hindu minority what happened was these Hindu minorities areas socially and politically impacted the Hindu majority central area and because of this the Hindus started to move away and the entire area became Hindu minority and the worry is 20 percentage of them are in the surrounding border districts which also today or tomorrow can pose national security challenges this is why I again reiterate that when I study tenets of Indian constitution applied here I do not see it being applied in letter and spirit and this tomorrow in fact today people are waiting uh, seeing through it but two decades down the line this can be a, even a security challenge because a the demography is getting tilted b it is in the border areas three the trend is not getting reversed and fourth that it is exponentially increasing with every passing day this is why I say that a virtual veto at 30 percentage is alarming alarming not from the point of view of a communal lens but alarming from the democratic lens because the democratic principles and tenets are not followed B 42 percentage is an absolute veto and three if you have a, a 16 percentage an inflection point where it has to be checked when I say it has to be checked well, what I refer to is that the majority population at that time should be aware whether the population rate on growth which is happening whether it is organic or whether it is forced because what you see in all these areas whether it is Malapuram Kishan Ganj the rate of Muslim pop uh, non Hindu population growth Muslim minority population growth the, te the rate of growth every decade has been more than the Hindu majority growth so what are you seeing and foreseeing in the next future I'm not talking about now but I'm talking about 2040 I'm talking about 2050 this tomorrow can be a challenge this is why I can reiterate and come back to my primary argument that our democracy's destiny will only and only be driven by how these areas function because if these areas tomorrow become isolated islands where different tenets are applied then it will be a challenge for the idea of Bharat which we speak about <clears throat> let me move to the next slide this yeah no, I it's I want to go to Bengal anyway okay let me uh, tell you another trend now this is very very interesting and I would like your attention on this the worrying aspect is that in tribal areas you are seeing a very unique trend and let me take a case in point in Jharkhand please look at this the tribal population in many parts of Jharkhand was 35 percentage in beginning of early 2000 it has dipped to 24 percentage now and the proportionate rise has been in Muslim minority population which is 15 percentage to 27 percentage now how does it impact it impacts on land ownership rights also because many areas of these tribal popular tribal areas have the Santal Pargana Act specific tribal act which ensures that the land ownership of the tribals only belong to the tribals but because of the skewed population you see interfaith marriages exponentially increasing where the daughter is generally a tribal girl because of which the person from the minority community gets access to land ownership rights and evidences suggest 
and lot of illegal immigration has started to be seen in these areas. So our traditionally tribal states, demography is changing and its character is also getting changing. And let's look at it. How does it impact the socio-economic condition? What do you see? A school, a local school in Jamtara, earlier never used to have an off on Friday. Because of a demography tilt, it changes its entire calendar where an off is given on a Friday. Uh, there are prayers, where there is an area in Garwa where the pray, a Hindu prayer and a tribal prayer used to happen. But because the certain part of the population, the students revolted to it, that prayer has changed. Saraswati Puja has become a challenge in those areas. And you are again seeing the trend where the Hindus and in particular tribal serfs fleeing from their areas. And this is happening in tribal areas. So it is not a Hindu-Muslim trend which I am saying. I am pointing that are there larger forces which are at play, which want to challenge this very idea of Bharat. And they are doing this in a very sustained manner and a very strategic manner where they are targeting certain areas. You saw what happened in a few years, uh, 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 two, two weeks back, I, if I'm not wrong, in Himachal Pradesh. People were out on the streets where they saw a mosque was not there and it suddenly came up. All of this cannot be, if you connect the dots, I see a larger trend where, I'm not saying that there is a trend to change India's demography, no. But I am pointing towards a trend to change demography of certain pockets of India and use them as isolated islands tomorrow to further activities and narratives which might not be in interest of Bharat. I will tell you why. So what I have proved till now in this presentation, A, it is concerted, B, it is pan-India, 3, it impacts constitution values, D, that it is also impacting social lives, and E, there is no reversal which is being seen till now. Which means, what do I mean by reversal? I have not come across a single area which is a Muslim majority area, a Muslim minority majority area which has tilted to become a Hindu majority area. So you are not seeing any place in this country where this trend starts and if it crosses a threshold, it does not reverse. Yes, now look at what happened and this is a very interesting case. I will tell you how it impacts locally. Now this is a Durga Mandir. This is a village which is in this area, this is called as Kangla Pari in uh, Bengal. Now in Kangla Pari, there are roughly, look at this point how it shifts the, uh, the entire uh, social economic condition. 300 Hindu families. Now 300 Hindu families wanted to perform Durga Puja. 25 Muslim minority families objected to it. The administration, the panchayats bore down and the 300 Hindu families found it difficult to perform Durga Puja because 25 Muslim minority families objected to. Again, what I reiterate, that there is also a possibility of a social veto on your civilizational ethos. And this is as local, this is a village when I am talking about. It is not a district, it is not a Lok Sabha constituency, it is not a state. I am talking about a village. And the puja organizers here could not host puja on that ground. Again, I reiterate, so what I prove now in my presentation is we will talk about great values of our economy. But what is our strategic and economic thinking in areas where we are seeing a reversal of trend? And this is as local and as big as possible. You know about the case in Bengal, uh, Assam, which you are very, very aware about. I will tell you another data point. There are 126 assembly constituencies roughly in Beng uh, Assam, out of which 40 are virtually only decided by the veto population. So if someone wants to take forward the Hindu cause in Assam, he does not begin from a point zero. He will begin from 126 minus 40. So, some, uh, so what is, is always a level playing field which used to exist before, that level playing field does not exist. This is why, if you remember the chief minister of Assam, 
also pointed about the glaring threat which can happen in 2040. It is not something which he has said out of sensationalism. Data tells you, look at the way it has shifted. 73 percentage were the, when we got it, 73 percentage. 73 percentage have now become 48 percentage and it has impacted 40 constituencies. And I'll tell you what, and this is not a statement which I'm making of sensationalism. This is a hard fact. Verdicts in this country change from one political party to another only because our demography is still not skewed. Because it is the majority in this country which has more tendency to vote on particular issues of development, welfareism and other aspects. But these areas do not see that happening. So when you see democracy moving from one party to the other, one government to the other, it is only because of the majority. Because the minority has a veto and this is happening on 40 constituencies which is like 30 percentage of your legislature is already decided it will only vote on religiosity. It is definitely a challenge and that is why our democracy's destiny will be determined by how these states in particular Assam and Bengal and other pocket districts function. It is not a joke when you look at the data. And now I come to you, I and everybody is right now pained <coughs> hearing what we saw in Tirupati with what happened with our Prasad and all of us feel a sense of betrayal. But the larger question is what? Are temple boards, there are governed by individuals from only our community? Absolutely not. These are just few examples which tell you that governments across states in particular, in, and this is largely a trend mostly in Bengal and others, have uh, non-Hindus determining the function of Hindu temples administratively. Can a secular state have this as a tenet of its policy at different state level? We need to ask ourselves on this because this is something which is against the tenet and the principle of secularism. Now let me sh uh, tell you another point and please uh, look at it. How it? Uh, this is what I want to conclude but before concluding this, I will tell you each state wise how is it shifting. Kerala. <laughs> Literacy rate roughly more than 90 percentage, uh, majority of the overall literacy rate more than 90 percentage. The growth rate of the Muslim minority population 16 percentage. This is more than the average rate of growth of population in Kerala which is 9 percentage. And this is double the rate of growth of the Hindu population in Kerala which is 7 percentage. Odisha, the rate of growth, even though the here again, why am I mentioning Odisha is very important because here there is no significant Muslim population, right? Or Muslim minority population. But look at the rate of growth. The rate of growth of the Muslim minority population, which is very insignificant in Odisha, is 31 percentage. Whereas of the Hindu population, which is determining, is 15 percentage. Even in a state where it is absolutely insignificant. Let's go to a state of Tripura. Hindu population 14 percentage. Non-Hindu minority population, 29 percentage. Assam, as I told you, 14 percentage, 30 percent, that's where the demography is tilted. In Uttar Pradesh, the Hindu rate of growth is 17 and a half percentage and the Muslim minority rate of growth is 27.5 percentage. In my state of Madhya Pradesh, the Hindu population rate of growth is 10 percentage and the non-Hindu Muslim popularity, uh, population growth rate is 17 percentage. In Gujarat, it is roughly the similar, which is a, a, a state of exception is what I can tell you. So, is there a larger trend which you are seeing and what will happen in the next three to four decades to come when this country will move forward? And this is what I say is my very big worry. My worry, ladies and gentlemen, is that voting in these areas are ha is happening on religiosity. What is our strategic policy in the next three decades to come? in these areas where economy does not drive, where Indian constitutional values do not drive. Point number one, do not forget, and this is what I say with a lot of authority, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a very educated barrister, was not an illiterate man, and if you read his entire life trajectory, the inflection point in his life and polity happened when he understood that demographically he can consolidate and he ensured that he could achieve his vision 
which was a blow to the idea of Bharat, which we still suffer from. So how will we treat those areas where religiosity is only important, which are anti-dharmic in their thought process? Which means that if a political party tomorrow in these areas says, Jai Shri Ram, you are out and you can't win. Is this as per the tenets of secularism? No. How will we treat those areas? Two, what about the economic development in these two in these areas? When we talk about providing welfare schemes, fine. But what about wealth creation in these areas? Three, what about the implementation of the constitutional values in these areas? And most importantly, and the absolutely most important factor, what about the right to life and right to freedom of expression to practice your culture of the minority in these areas which are the Hindus in nature? We don't look at Hindus as minorities in Bharat, absolutely not. But what about the Hindus there? Why should they flee from those areas? What is our strategic thinking in the next two decades that they do not flee from these areas? This is what we as an <clears throat> intellectual dharmic community should come forward with solutions. I don't have answers to. I have lived in these areas for days, whether it is Malda and Murshidabad, to come to these conclusions. None of them is conjecture. None of this is an example which is quoted. All of this is backed by trends of voting patterns, I see. So if you ask me, ladies and gentlemen, that all of the, oh, everything can happen. But if we cannot take care of our democratic values in significant chunk of our country, which are at least roughly, which tomorrow in two decades will become 100 Lok Sabha constituencies out of 543, which is 20 percentage. So how do you take, take care of these 20 percentage areas, of the minorities in these areas, of economic values in these areas? This is what I believe, for me, is extremely important. And this is how it, the Bharat's destiny will be decided in the years to come. And I will tell you a very important point. There is a tribe in Nagaland, and this, I, this is something which came to me and I was very shocked to know. It's called a Sumia tribe. I might be wrong. In the, yes, it is called a Sumia tribe. And I will end this and open, to, uh, open the floor to questions, if any, because I don't want to be between you and the dinner. This Sumia tribe is a Sumia Naga tribe. This Naga community initially was all practicing the tribal cultural values. But you saw infiltration in these areas and slowly and gradually the Sumya Naga women married Muslim men, which is fine. But the issue was they left their Naga culture and these areas of Sumya Naga now seeing Sumya Muslim cultural values being driven. We don't have problem with any interfaith marriages. But the trend which you see is the culture of the tribal area or the Hindu area changes. This is another social challenge which are happening in pockets. Because these are pockets we don't see. These are spots which we don't realize because we talk about the larger polity. But this for me is a challenge. This is why ladies and gentlemen I say, and towards the end I think this is my conclusion, that our democracy's destiny in next three decades will primarily, will also be determined with how our demography tilts and what is our response to those tilt areas. Thank you so much. If any questions, please. So, um, my question is uh, very simple actually. We are in Pondicherry, Tamil Nadu. And here actually when you talk about population tilt, you have to talk of non-Muslim, the other. You have to talk about Christianity very, very seriously. So, what is your uh, uh, experience in terms of whether or not Christians also vote en bloc, uh, forsaking democratic values, or do they, is it like a veto vote? Not as... I will not conclude uh, Christian vote as a veto vote right now. But I will just tell you, in the state of Punjab, what we are seeing is this whole concept and this is where that person might be a Jat Sikh or might be a, a SC, but they have adopted Christianity uh, which is there. They might not be Christians on paper, but they have adopted Christianity. So the maximum rate of growth of churches 
in this country is happening in Punjab. And if I'm not wrong, and if my memory serves me right, that the largest church in India is being also built in Punjab. So I don't see a trend of voting veto with them. But yes, they are in an influential, influential body which impacts outcomes, but not a veto for sure. It is not that if somebody else from another community is select, uh, you know, is voted or is a candidate there, the abs there is an absolute no to voting. No. So I will not call it a veto yet. Absolutely not. My question is, first of all, they are the uh, second majority. That's the narrative we need to yes. uh, promote. And second thing, uh, like you have talked about uh, Jinnah and all. Now, it's the Prime Minister who says in hand, one hand they, sh they should have Quran Which in the other right. hand. Uh, See, uh, I so that they can make bomb out of it. Now, basically, l let, me, let me complete, let me complete. Now, the thing is, you see it as a threat or challenge. Now, basically, which is uh, a challenge for democracy, can soon be turned into Sharia law. And uh, we have seen Sarji Limam, just okay, okay. We have seen Sarji Limam, what he said about chicken neck uh, uh, to cut that part. We know the threat. Now, you are in the government. Now, you are the spokesperson. What is the solution? Like, we are here for the solution. We all know what is the threat. We, uh, like, uh, you just entered the CA, CA came. When, when is the NRC, like uh, wha now Sheikh Hasina is gone, what is, the, what is the roadmap for that? All the fear mongering, I, I am saying fear mongering in the correct term, it's a genuine threat. Now, because of that you got the vote, but what is the solution? What is the solution which uh, you got the vote for it? That is the question, what is the solution? So uh, my dear friend, uh, as I rightly said that this is a challenge, nowhere am I saying Again, reiterate, what, or whatever you have said, none of this has been mentioned by my speech. You've used terms which are there. None of this is mentioned. I ve I'm very, very choosy with my word. So don't put those words in my mouth. Neither have I said this. You are asking what is the solution? Absolutely, at this moment, it is an evolving thing which we have to find a solution to. You can't, uh, you can't look at a large population in this country and say, no, you, ha you, don't, you have to completely look away towards it. There has to be a solution. What is the solution? Right now, I don't have an answer to. Neither I have the authority to answer you in any responsible position. I have mentioned you a potential challenge which can come. You come with ideas if you have any. Let us all come with ideas uh, at the end of the day because it is to do with Bharat. But none of what you said has been mentioned by me. My enemies. Don't sensationalize it and do not you know, go into this whole rating of TRPizing it for making words like bombs and others. Absolutely none of it has been said by me. It, yeah. I have used and chosen my words in a very, very responsible manner. Yeah, uh, I think we all know that in 2026, there is going to be a delimitation exercise. Absolutely, sir. So, what is it that this government is going to do to address some of the issues which you have raised? Sir, I think this, is, this, this uh, thing is absolutely in cognizance, is all what I can tell you. The delimitation exercise is happening and it will ultimately fructify. Uh, I don't have the details to... Uh, the more de more details uh, or I can't mention more than that. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'm from Iran. Yes. And uh, I just want to add in this presentation, if I lost my country, if I lost my culture because of uh, Islam uh, since 70 years before the Western, I mean US and Europeans and uh, Islam to my country and I lost everything and uh, this presentation it's really extremely extremely important and kindly requested to all the people is here please be careful of your culture that's it <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question I'm from Nagar Koyil uh, op I think in 2021 uh, 20, uh, elections, I discovered that the population of uh, Kanyakumari district uh, is 59.8 percent Christians, as on records. Um, so what I noticed is every election, the diocese uh, 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 distributes a uniform message, a message uh, which travels to all the churches, just the Sunday mass before the election and the message is very clear they openly talk about there are 
three Christians, you might have doubt on which Christian you must you must vote. Okay, so we uniformly have decided God's messenger as this person, and you can vote. So my question is, why is the government not intervening in the religion's right to discuss politics? Where, why are we giving the religion rights to discuss politics at their religious places? Ma'am, I think the constitution provides every religion to discuss whatever they want to. I can only say that as a society, as a Bharati society, as a Hindu society, the unity is what only can save the country and take the country forward. That is what I can say. Uh, on this part, uh, are, these might be some isolated incidents. That is all I can conclude. My issue is not at all to do with any democracy. Again, I reiterate. My issue is that in these, again, specific points, I don't see constitutional values being implemented. And I don't see them implemented in letter and spirit. I want a thriving democracy, which we are right now. And all of us want it to continue. So this is something which we have to look at as a challenge. But on that part, everybody is free to discuss, practice their religion. That is what our constitution guarantees. And if somebody is doing any illegal act, the law will take its own course. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. It's really uh, quite worrisome and challenging in front of all of us. My question would be, how do you see the work laws in this context? And the, it will be implemented is what I can tell you in the near future. Wow. The bill will be implemented in the near future. This will be implemented for sure. Thank and you. Take this from Thank me you so much. Because it is to do with justice. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to a book written by an Englishman called Douglas Murray. Okay. In which he quotes uh, a leader of uh, the Muslim world who gives out the strategy for conquering the world. And uh, the strategy is as follows that we will invade you through your democracy and we will overwhelm you through the wombs of our women. Now, are we seeing, as you said, there is a strategy at play here which is being exercised and if we know the strategy, then what, are, what can we do about it? Uh, sir, I haven't gone through the book. If you can give me a copy to, of it, I will study the book and then respond on exactly what, in with what context has it been said. Thank you. Uh, are we? No, I believe I'm, it's you. What, you want a question? You have talked about, uh, you know, the rate of growth. But uh, there is a hidden fact in the rate of growth, especially when you talk about border districts and security issues. Yes. We have to address illegal immigration. Absolutely, yes. So can we talk about illegal immigration? And uh, the gentleman there touched about it. Uh, can we talk about CAA and its pathetic implementation? And what of the NRC? Are we scared? Uh, Ma'am, on the allergy on uh, CAA, if you have better, uh, uh, the CAA, this is the only government in the last 70 years which have uh, you know spoken about implementing ca and i if you have some suggestions to give you can definitely give i'll pass it on okay i will pass on the suggestion to the concerned people ma'am thank you i hello Hi. So basically what I wanted to ask is like most of the people know about this do data. Most of the people are aware about this data. But rather than depending on the state always, what a common Hindu or a common man can do and You know look, what to do. I don't know. I know. You should, after thing, you know what to do. No, but uh, like if you could guide something. How can I guide? It. You know what to do on this. So that's what happens. It keeps on depending and the loop keeps on increasing. As I said, you know what to do. I will tell you after the stage what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah.
I'll tell uh, you know what to do. I will when I get down. I'll tell you what to do. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.